Ladies and gentlemen, put on a third pair of socks, chase the lice out of your sleeping mat, and see if you've got enough pennies to get drunk off of. Because it's time to talk tall to me. It's time to talk tall to me. <laughs> I'm Omen Sade. And I am Nick McGill. And this is Talk Tall to Me, a meander through the neighborhoods and docklands that is the collected work of prog rock band Jethro Tull. One shuffling, shambling footstep at a time, we trudge our way through the discography, looking for sandwiches and songs in the garbage can. But we are not alone, because you are there to keep us warm under the railroad bridge. Sleeping naked under cardboard boxes together. That's right. Like one big puppy pile. So, uh, Nick, this is a momentous moment. A moment, a momentous moment. It, it is. It is. A momentous moment. It is a monumental moment. First of all, I want to announce that... Due to a very awesome collaboration, I have, you can probably hear, a new recording box so I don't have to be under a towel anymore. That's right. Very exciting. No more towel recording. No more towel recording. Except for fun, maybe. (laughs) For funsies. For funsies. So that's fun. Also, we have come back from our talkation. We hope that you, our listeners, are all well-rested, tanned, relaxed, and we are jumping into a new album. A new album, first song. But wait, I have an email. <gasps> dun, 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 dun. It's email dance. <laughs> I know I already recorded this. We, we got a sting. I'll put it in okay. here. <laughs> okay, great. <clears throat> Your emails, sir. That's great, Nick. Yeah. This is from Jason K. And it's it's really apt right now. Based on the content of his email tied in with what we are about to get into. It was timely on his behalf. He sent it a little while ago, but it I mean What is time? It's convenient that we are starting it now. Uh, The subject, (laughs) the subject is talk tall to me is not so bad. Oh, hey. (laughs) It's a. I've heard worse. That's yep. Yeah, I'll take it. I'll take it. All right. (laughs) The body of the message. Like what you boys be doing. Tall fan forever. (laughs) It really started with a friend in high school telling me that any statement could have the beautiful cadence of an aqualung line. Sitting on a park bench is the same in the car full of cassette listeners as stopping at a red light. Stopping at a red light. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, that's, that makes sense. <laughs> that sounds exactly like what a uh, like a high school conversation that I'm yeah, shocked I, that we didn't have. Favorite album right now? Walk into light, lol. <laughs> Walk Into Light was Ian Anderson's first solo album. Oh, wow. Yeah. I don't. I have actually never heard that. I'm not sure if he's being facetious with the lol, but... Are you are you saying lol, LOL? LOL. Yeah, cool. Lol. Not lol. Lo, not lol. Lol. <laughs> it's not L-O-W-E-L-L. Lowl. Laugh Out Loud. Favorite album right now, Walk Into Light, Laugh Out Loud. Great. And he closes with Cheerio, and that's it. Oh. Just a quick little drop-in. Thank you so much. Short and sweet. For your... What was his name? Just the little... Uh, Jason K. Jason Cave. K. Just the letter K. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Thanks, Jason. Just a quick little line. Tell us how you got into Tull. I love it. It's great. Yeah. Keep them wonderful. coming, guys. Much appreciated. Thanks so, so much. And by guys, we mean... Folks. Lads, ladies, everyone in between. Collective. 
peoples. Peoples of the Earth. And anyone on the International Space Station right now. Anyone else from anywhere where you want to email from, totally down for it. Absolutely. We're down for it. Yep. That's great, Nick. Do we have any other housekeeping business? That was it for that. I just had that email and, and we're good to go. Okay, fantastic. Because I am positively chomping at the bit right now. <laughs> you done? For, for the moment, yes. <laughs> for now. Yeah, we are going to get, we're going to start talking about Aqualung. Tall. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, Aqualung. Aqualung, yeah. Or Tall, yes, but Aqualung. The album. The album. Wow. Who is our lineup? We have a little a little bit of a change here. We do. We do. So we do have the usual suspects. We have Mr. Ian Anderson yep. on the flute and on the songwriting and on the singing, a little acoustic guitar. Yep. We have the Prince of My Heart, <laughs> Martin Lancelot Barr on the electric guitar. Yep. Now here's where it gets interesting. Uh-huh. We do still have Clive Bunker, although I am sad to say this is Clive Bunker's last album with Jethro Tull. That's right. So weep, 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 weep. Get as much of that Bunker bash in now as you can. Yeah, bash it. We have the official edition of, Nick. John Evan. From the John Evan band from... The Blades. From The Blades and others. No longer just credited as a studio musician. He is an official member now with uh, the piano, the organ, and, of course, the Mellotron. (laughs) Mellotron. Mellotron. Mellotron can only rock. I am here to audition for Jethro Tull. (laughs) Stop drilling, Mellotron. (laughs) You hit oil. (laughs) And, And now here's where things get interesting. Yeah. Glenn Cornick, we bid you adieu. Thanks, Glenn. It was, a, it was a great time rocking out with you. Thank you for everything that you've done. Thank you for your your infectious onstage energy, your incredible bass riffs. Enter the scene. What did we say? You say his name three times and he will appear? That's right. You sing about him three times. That's right. It's very specific. Welcome Jeffrey Hammond Hammond to Jethro Tull. That's right. New bassist, some a couple of backing vocals on Mother Goose, and uh, he is he is in for the kind of the long haul. I think I think he's in here for a, a little bit. A longish haul, yeah. yeah. And and now Nick, when you say new bassist, you of course mean new old bassist because oh, Jeffrey right. Hammond Hammond was a part of the Blades, part of John Evan Band, part mm-hmm. of John Evan Smash. Yeah, he was John a part of Evan Smash. All the, Easy, John. You, we don't want you to get angry. John Evan. He was he was a part of that kind of that primordial ooze that was proto tall. Yeah, yeah, he was. He was the, he was the Blackpool Blackpool musician sludge. He was dredged up. He just climbed out of that pool a little bit later than the others. He sh- he sure all. did. Yeah, he's a he's a late he's a late he's a, a late ooze climber. a late evolver. Yeah. Yeah. The last thing I want to know is we got some great and beautiful, some really gorgeous uh, orchestral arrangement and conducting by Dee Palmer. Amazing. This is one of the, the first ones that I think Dee Palmer is really, like, credited with. That's great. They may have dabbled a little bit earlier on, but I think this is one of the first big ones. Probably because this is the first time that they could afford <laughs> actual strings. Uh, absolutely, yeah. So, Nick. Yeah. How did Jeffrey Hammond Hammond finally join the Jethro Tull band? I'm glad you asked. What had happened was, after some years of departure from the land of music, Jeffrey had been to art school, Mm -hmm. and he had then applied to another art school, I think the the Royal Academy of of Arts or something, fine arts, like, like something like this. And... Tragically for his arts career, but fortunately for us, he did not get in. Sad tear. I know he went, after he left Tull, he went back into art. Yeah. 
Well, you can you can take the you can take you can take the paintbrush out of the pot, but you can't ever wash the bristles clean, as they say. That's they do say that often. They say they say it a lot. Yeah. So, um, his old friend Ian Anderson took pity on him because he was had no career options. He had he was living in London, but couldn't afford it because his grant had ra- had run out for from his previous schooling, and he wasn't into the new program. And so Ian said, Jeffrey, why don't you why don't I pay you to redecorate my my apartment while I'm on tour. Really? So he did, so he, yeah, he did that. <laughs> and then when Ian came back, it was around the time of Jeffrey Hammond Hammond's birthday. And guess what Ian Anderson gave Jeffrey Hammond Hammond for his birthday? A job. A bass guitar. <laughs> and said, "Learn, relearn how to play this and join the band. Wow. And Jeffrey Hammond Hammond was like, well, I got no future. I got no job. I've got this bass. I may as well join one of the greatest rock bands in the history of rock and roll. So I'm curious to know how long they knew Glenn was leaving. Like, was he, were they desperate to find a replacement or like, how did, what's the time period on that? My impression of they, they were touring the benefit album in America Glenn Cornick decided to leave. I'm not clear on the details around that departure. Uh-huh. So they they came back to Britain, I think at the end of their tour, with a little bit of time before they started recording the next album, which was Aqualung, and needed to find a bass player in that space of time. And Ian okay. convinced Jeffrey Hammond Hammond to be that bass player. And then they went straight into recording. Yeah. And this is where and this is where I think some of those rehearsals may have come into play because I think Glenn Cornick was like literally teaching Jeffrey how to play the bass. Oh my God. <laughs> and Jeffrey Hammond Hammond has said, you know, cause he played the bass before in the blades and such, but it, it had been years. And he, he stated at various points that he doesn't, he didn't really know how to play the instrument. He, they would just sort of be like, okay, put your fingers here, 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 and here. And then go strum, strum, strum. And he was very good at parroting. Yeah. He was, he was good at playing Jethro Tull songs. After he'd been shown how. Yeah. <laughs> so we went from art student to interior decorator to immediately recording Aqualung. That's like the most epic thing that could happen to you. Yeah. I keep waiting. I keep <laughs> waiting. <laughs> you got to keep... Anderson. You got to learn the bass. That's, I mean, my that's... Bir- my birthday's coming up. I'm, I'm holding out hope. <laughs> that's it. I, that, I guess that's it. I guess that's... It got to wait for the, uh, the the birthday, the birthday base, the birthday base from 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 uh, Ian Anderson, from old Uncle Ian. Uncle Ian sent you a, another base. Aw, <laughs> where am I, I going to put one it? Last year, <laughs> it's like the sweaters. Yeah, put it in your sock drawer. <laughs> so Nick, yeah. Now that we know some of the ingredients in the fourth album soup. Shall we mm-hmm. have a little sip? Let's see what's right on top. Nope, get get rid of the fly. There, yeah, there, there it is. <gasps> it is it's the first song on the album. It's Aqualung. So let's maybe we should listen to it now. Let's have a listen. <laughs> Uh, Nick, I'm going to have a quick cigarette. Yeah, I need a shower and a sandwich. Yeah. That's in, that's intense. That's an intense... I mean, like, you know, it's sort of... It's almost a it's almost a cliche to say that a lot of... You know, that everyone's first introduction to Jethro Tull is the song Aqualung. Yeah. Uh, um, but it was mine. Right. I imagine for most it is. Yeah. But, um... Wow, I mean, it it hooks you. It's it's not my favorite Jethro Tull song. Sure, but it's really good. It's really good. It's really hefty. It's really hard compared to a lot of their stuff. 
hard sounding you mean like, yeah like like, like heavy rock. like hard yeah which is yeah, yeah yeah but then you have that little you have that moment of of acoustic in it mhm yeah which allows you to breathe and you need that i think in the song cuz it is so hard that you need you need a little bit of contrast well i think that's also that's also a great setup for the rest of the album cuz there are a lot of I just listened to it just today, the whole album, and there are, I forgot how many, like, little, gorgeous little, uh, like, acoustic snippets there are Yeah. dotted in between some of these yeah. heavier pieces. Yeah, that, yeah, totally. The whole album is, is peppered with them. And, and I think that's part of the thing that makes it such a listenable album is because it really takes care of the listener. Yeah, that's, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. Thank you. It's taken us four albums, but we finally got it. Yeah. So this song is, I think, one of the first, maybe one of the first collaborations with Jenny Franks. I think it is or, or, the only collaboration with Jenny Franks. And act, is it? Okay. Songwriting wise. And I believe it is the only collaboration in the entire history of Jethro Tull. Oh, int- yeah. Yeah, maybe. Would you like to hear about the origin of this song, Nick, from The Horse's Mouth. Is this the September 1999 Guitar World interview? <laughs> no. Oh, okay. It's um, it's taken from the book A Passion Play, The Story of Ian Anderson and Jethro Tull, which I highly recommend that all of you Tull heads out there go and get a copy of. Uh, obviously, the the ballad of Jethro Tull is coming out quite soon, which is the the official the official official Tull published Tull biography. But this is a very very well researched book with a lot of interviews with the band with the band members, and it's it's really great. Nick, carry on. Oh, <laughs> I thought maybe you'd gone away for a minute. So, would you like to hear what Ian Anderson has to say about this song? Yeah. Okay. Now, Nick, I I am a master of accents, but I I might need some help with my Ian Anderson accent. So at any point that you want to stop me and give me some pointers, go ahead. You got it. The title track has always been jointly credited to Jenny Anderson, my first wife, and myself. We were only married for about a year. We got divorced a couple of years later. Not unhappily. It's just that we were both kind of young. She was Jewish, and I wasn't. Oh. Side sidebar, I'm not really sure what that has, that has to do with it, but who knows. In fact, she had been taking photographs because she was in some sort of college, and at that time... <laughs> some sort of college. And at that time was very much into tramps, very much into dirty old men, which, ex- oh <laughs> which explains why we came to meet, because that's the sort of image I had. Well, her mother certainly made her aware of that fact, if I didn't before. She had taken some photographs of this particular guy who was a very striking figure. He had a defiance and nobility about him. Anyway, Jenny had scribbled down some lines about this guy. I said, hey, let's make this into a song. We talked about the guy, and she came up with a few lines. I tried to show her how that could become a song. We wrote the lyrics to the first couple of verses, and so she contributed to the the lyrics of Aqualung. It's a good song, and it's probably the only time that I have ever written anything with anybody else lyrically. Wow. Ian Anderson. Hot one pack. Yeah. Yeah, I want to, I'll tack on from the 1999 Guitar World interview. Hey, wait a minute, Nick. Yeah. How was my accent? It was it was actually pretty good. Oh, I was not I'm Is that genuine? It's Yeah, oh yeah, no. yeah. It's it's that like clipped pronounced haughty Yeah. I'm I'm Ian Anderson that we all know and love. Maybe maybe by uh, maybe by like A I I really will have gotten it. Oh yeah. Yeah, we'll get you there. Okay, great. Whew. So now that we have that covered, um what's the what's the uh, interview nineteen what? 1999 Guitar World magazine uh, September issue. Okay. Oh, uh, the a, idea that was a good September. That was where was I in 1999? Let's see. I was. We were 14. Oh, we were 14. It oh no, we just, hadn't met. It was just before we met. Ooh, it was. We a bad, hadn't met. It was yet. a bad time. 
life was awful. Yeah. <laughs> it was empty. The idea came about from a photograph my wife at the time took of a tramp in London. I had feelings of guilt about the homeless, as well as fear and insecurity with people like that who seem a little scary. Hmm. And I suppose all of that was combined with a slightly romanticized picture of the person who is homeless, but yet a free spirit, who either won't or can't join in society's prescribed formats. Ooh. Yeah. And then a, l- a little bit further... Your philosophy is showing... <laughs> Uh, And then just a a reference to the music itself. It's quite a tortured tangle of chords, but it was meant to really drag you here and there and then set you down into the more gentle acoustic section of the song. Mm. And I think that's pretty accurate. It does that. Yeah. It does it. Is this the song where Martin was playing the solo, (laughs) was recording the solo, Uh and who Jimmy Page walked yeah. in? Yeah, so they, this was recorded at Island uh, Island Records, and they Led Zeppelin was recording in the downstairs studio. So Island Records was apparently a new studio. Both bands were there. They had been touring a lot together, and so they knew each other. And actually, Nick, would you like to hear the story of that incident from The Pony's Mouth? The, the Knight's Mouth, yeah. Would you? Yeah. Do you want to hear it? Do you want to hear the story? <laughs> yes. Who's a good podcaster? Oh, my book's upside down. Hold on a second. <laughs> I don't have much space to navigate in the booth. All right. So now, um, now bear with me as I find my uh, my Martin Barr accent. Led Zeppelin were recording downstairs at Island Studios while I was doing the solo. It might have been the second take, and it was going really well. Jimmy Page walked into the control room and started waving wildly, and I thought, (laughs) should I wave back and mess up the solo and have to do another one? Or should I just grin and carry on? So, being a professional to the end, I grinned, and that was the solo that is on the album. It's true! (laughs) One of the... Most well-known guitar solos. It was like ranked in the top 100 guitar solos or something. I don't have the number in front of me, but like it was, it is a very well-respected guitar solo. Nick, do you and think? And Jimmy Page almost ruined it. Well, he knew. He was like, oh, I, I got to You're doing it. I want. You're doing it. I want my guitar solos to be up there. Do you think it was sabotage on Jimmy Page's part? Oh. Okay, real question though. Do you think part of the reason that solo is so good, because it is really good. It's, it is, it's chunky. It's good. Is because Martin Barr was like, oh, Jimmy Page is watching me. Arguably one of the best guitar players on the scene. I have to bring it. Yeah, I can't, I cannot mess this up. I just want to know what was going through his head. Come on, Martin. Come on. You got this. You can do this, Lancelot. Pull the sword out of the stone. That's King Arthur. Find the Holy Grail. That's Gal- That's Galahad. Confront the Green Knight. <laughs> that was Gawain. That was Gawain. Tune back to our other podcast, Argue Arthurian Knights to me. A thousand and one Arthurian Knights. Also heavily featuring Martin Barr. Believe <laughs> it or not. Yeah, he's, he's, a, <laughs> he's a crossover artist. Yep. <laughs> so... Nick. Yeah. We've talked a lot about facts. We've heard a lot from the official records. We've heard a lot of anecdotes. But um, what does this song do to your soul? In what neighborhood of your soul does this song live? It doesn't make me comfortable, either musically or lyrically. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's – I think it's supposed to be that way. You think it's supposed to make you feel comfortable? Uncomfortable. Oh, uncomfortable. Yeah. Oh, I got yeah, you. Yeah, I, I, I think working as intended. I got I – got, I started to drown in a sea of, dog, of double negatives there for a second. <laughs> I am not unsorry. <laughs> uh, 
I, it's, it's a very potent song. Yeah. Even after hearing it countless times, literal countless times, even with it being played and really one of the few tall songs that are, that, that are really acknowledged, it's still, there's still some power behind it. Yeah, there is. You know, it's it's funny knowing the origin of this song in terms of Jenny taking a photograph of a homeless guy and, and the song being based off of that. Mm. I I feel like that doesn't add anything to my understanding of it because it's like the song is so clear that that's what it's about. Yeah, it's it. There's no. This is not one of those cryptic. We have to figure out what this song is about. Songs. No, it's this. It's a. It's a hearty oven warmed juicy slice of life and it is not sweet it's like a it's like a nettle pie it's it does fall in the narrator category where the narrator is telling us the story as opposed to it is not an omniscient narrator it is an actual person in this story right I, though I feel like it's not exactly – it's not a story in the same way that some of the other songs are stories. Sure. Right. It's it's more of a like an observer. Yeah. Which but, I, the, but the narrator slash singer is the observer. Totally, yes. I'm, I'm just – I'm trying to say there's – this is – this song is given to us secondhand essentially because we're being told it. Right. Does that make sense? I think so. I think so. It's sort of like, but there, it, I, th- I think that the reason both of us are stuttering as if we've never spoken the English language before is because I think this is actually a new kind of songwriter relationship to the audience than we, than we have seen before with Tull. Possibly. I think there's something a little bit unique about this in that He's not really saying, this is how my life is. And he's not saying, this is the life of this character. He's saying, I see this. I yeah, see this. Yeah, okay. I am, I am bearing witness to this life. Yep. And what a strange, okay. strange and noble and awful life it is. It's sort of completely... Yeah. And it's totally... It's totally... There's no judgment there either. It's not. It's not like saying... Oh, this guy is homeless, and isn't he a bad person because he does this and this? Yeah, it's statement of fact. Yeah, it's just it's just a it's like direct experience, and I think that that's why it hits so hard is because it's like you totally see through his eyes, and you see this guy, you see Aqualung. Yeah. Yeah, the character, the homeless man, is named Aqualung. Right. Which the definition of an Aqualung? Nick, of course, is a breathing apparatus. It's pre-scuba, essentially, right? It's like the... It's just pre-scuba, I think. Oh, I think it was named by um, that French guy. Oh, the French guy? Yep. Jacques Cousteau. That's the one. That's, that's the one? That's the only French guy. The only French guy, yep. One French guy! Um... <sighs> One French fry. Dipped in my sauce. So, yeah. So, why is he called Aqualung? Only one French guy. (laughs) Dipping in my fry sauce. (laughs) Why, why 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 is the character's name Aqualung, Nick? The sound that he makes when he breathes with his his pneumonia lungs. <laughs> I'm assuming. <laughs> yeah. That, that one. I similar. Yeah. Similar. Yeah. I'm guessing, right? I I think you're. Yeah, I think you're on it. And like you know, you know, you don't, you don't ever know the homeless person's name or the stranger's name, but Correct. you you name them something based on a quality. Mm. You know, mm-hmm. like, hey, it's the tall guy. It's it's hey, it's glasses. You know, hey, it's it's Aqualung. 
Yeah, yeah. Right? I, I, no, totally. It's, I, I think you're, yeah, you're right. He, effectively, society has put him in a place where he where he doesn't have a name. Even though he, poor, he is nameless, he, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do we want to unpack some of the Britishisms that are found within this song? Just really quick, the character on the, the front, we'll get into the art later in the weeks, because yes. there's a story behind the, the artwork of this album, but the the character on the front is not Ian Anderson's homeless man character. It is supposed to be Aqualung. Right. And the on the inside of the album art is is more art uh, by this artist, and that is where the Talk Tall to Me picture comes from. The little the little podcast cover comes from. It's from the inside of the Aqualung album. The podcast cover comes from. <laughs> so. Yeah, Britishisms. Leg hurting bad as he bends to pick a dog end. Are you asking me or are you setting me up? I, <laughs> at this point, the line between those things is so slim. The answer is yes. Do you, do you, know, do you know what a dog end is? I do. It's an old, uh, it's an old discarded cigarette. Ah, but, there you are. Okay, now you ask. Yeah. Now you ask me one. Is the bog anything but an actual bog? It is not an actual bog. Because, really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, is that bathroom? Yep. Bog means toilet. Okay. Goes down to a bog and warms his feet. Right. I imagine you know, like when when you go to, I imagine it's the sort of situation when you when you visit. A McDonald's, for instance, in downtown Manhattan, and you go to the bathroom mm. there, you might find someone warming their feet. Yeah, right, because it's 20 degrees out right now. Yeah. 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 Also, though, the term bog is is used to, to describe something which is devoid of frills. Something, oh, something okay. very standard or basic. They, apparently, there's a, there's a term bog standard is a, is a term. Oh, yeah. Used. I've heard that before. So I do think in this case it is referring to a public toilet. Sure. Right. That would make more sense. Nick. Yeah. The armies up the road. Yeah. That one I don't know. Oh. Shall I tell you? Yeah, please. Now, I'm going to tell you this in the form of an image. You're walking. Oh, I see it. You're walking. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you're walking down the streets. It's coming up on Christmas. There's snow in the air. You hear ding, 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 ding. You see a red cauldron supported by a tripod. Ding, 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 ding. Ah. What are you seeing? What are you seeing? The Salvation Army. Oh, so he could go up there to get charity. To get a cup of he tea. He could go up the road. Yeah. yeah. Huh. But... Okay, I, but it's interesting because that it says salvation a la mode and a cup of tea. Because I think that what they generally did was mm. give you a cup of tea and talk Jesus at you. Yeah, yeah, they're God's army. They are God's army. Yeah, you know they have like actual ranks, army ranks for their people. I'm not surprised. Yeah, apparently they're a little. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I donate my old stuff to uh, Goodwill. Yeah. Oh yeah. I also do. Yeah. I wish I had old stuff to donate. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had goodwill. <laughs> Anything else? Any any other uh, any other um, Britishisms? No, the army was the last one that really stuck out to me. That's not. I wouldn't even call that a Britishism, though. No. Because we have that here. Dead duck, not really a Britishism. Right. Shabby means old. Oh my. Oh, thank you for thank you. For that. <laughs> Spitting out pieces of his broken luck? You know, I when I first listened to it, I used to think that it was spitting out pieces of his broken lung. I think I might have too, yeah. Because he's aqua lung. I think that that's just that his down in the dumps, like terrible luck, is physically manifested by his poor dental hygiene. Oh, wow. That's the image that I've had for a while, like him like actually just pulling out teeth. Wow, that's... That's so horrific, Nick. Visceral. Yeah. I interpreted it more to 
to mean the way that some homeless people speak to themselves. I ride the MTA. Oh, yeah. I have a lot of time to observe homeless people who may or may not also have mental health issues. Right. Because those things go so frequently hand in hand. But there, there is sort of a quality of movement and, and, and speaking to oneself that I've seen a lot where people kind of angrily spit out these words and yeah. in a way that's blaming the things that have brought them to their current predicament. Yeah, right. Which like, you know. Right, whether whether manufactured or real, there's there is some cause. In their minds, there is some link to what got them there. Well, and there are real causes as well. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But but depending on what what they're seeing, you know, what they're blaming it on. Who said one time we all, all each of us is only six bad decisions away from pooping in a gutter? I've never heard that before. My, first time I heard that, I was like, six, please. <laughs> yeah, six seems like a lot to be honest. <laughs> what kind of what kind of charmed life do you lead? <laughs> Six Degrees of Pooping in a Gutter, I think is... Oh, I love that book. Yeah. That's the new... Gen- that, that was made into a new Jennifer Aniston movie. Yeah. No, it's it's really good. Really good, I think. Um, She plays the gutter. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm sorry. Is that too much? <laughs> that took a turn. Ooh. And that was decision number one. There it is. Musically, Omen, how do you feel about this? Ooh, Lord. This, you know, I'm so glad that we talked about this lineup. Because it's, it's, I, I really feel like everyone is identifiable. Although, wait, I'm having a moment. Is there no flute in this song? I was just going to ask you the same thing. I don't think there's any they flute. They opened one of their biggest albums after Benefit, which sold over a million copies. Which is flute heavy. They open it with no flute. And then they continue it with no flute on Locomotive Breath. Well, that's not the next track, but... Well, no, Cross-Eyed Mary's next, and that has flute. That has flute. It has a a decent chunk of flute. A decent chunk of flute, now available in candy size. That's the portion that I I like of my flute, is a decent chunk. Yeah, but uh, but obviously Ian's presence is very strong. Um, Martin Barr. Yeah. Don't get me started. Yep. And you you know who I really think brings this song together? Is John Evan. Huh. Okay. The piano is really present throughout and really helps to tie everything together. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a nice through line. It's like it's like a protective webbing along the outside keeping everyone in. Yeah, exactly. It's like what a trucker puts over the back of their load. Yeah. Yeah, we don't we don't want this this precious cargo to fall off. Right. Oh, we lost we lost Jeffrey Hammond Hammond on <laughs> Highway 60. <laughs> so the, as I was starting to listen to it, I wasn't hearing a lot of Jeffrey Hammond Hammond. And I and for the first couple of minutes of the song, I thought, oh, he's sort of hiding in the back because he still doesn't know how to play his bass. <laughs> but then we get to Martin's guitar solo where he's showing off for Jimmy Page. And you hear that incredible bass where he busts out with this sort of like. Yeah. And it's like, it's this glorious syncopated walking bass that just comes out of nowhere and then he disappears. And that's it. That's the last, last anyone ever heard of that, Jeffrey Hammond. That Hammond. A short, shorter, shorter tenure than, than Tommy Ioni. That's it. Tony. Tony Iommi. Tony Ahomi. <laughs> Google, Google all of these things, please. Let's see. I'm trying to remember. At the tail end of Benefit, we started... Was it just trying to be? I think it was just trying to be. We were saying 
it felt like Ian finally finally started to find his voice. Yeah. Uh-huh. And this is the voice that he found. This is the voice. There is something Nick, I'm going to I'm going to say something. Please. Ian Anderson had been working with this kind of persona, this kind of strange vagrant persona, and now he has had this real experience, you know, albeit through a photograph, through Jenny Franks, mm-hmm. with this real person who who was living the life that Ian has sort of been conjuring the image of for a long time. And I I think that something spiritual has happened. I think that I think that that person Aqualung, as we as we have named him, that real person who lives down by the docks on by the Thames, was sort of a shamanistic spirit animal for Ian Anderson, and, and has allowed him to unleash something in in himself. There was there was definitely some sort of catharsis. There was he he clicked something something that he'd been searching for or didn't know that he had been searching for happened when he had this moment with this homeless person and i i think with jenny's help too sometimes it takes another person to show you something that you're too close to see for yourself yeah like like the haircut on the back of your head you need help yeah you do yes you do yes i do What about you, Nick? Anything musical for you that stands out to you in this? I think it's a little too long. Okay. I think they could have moved the solo in a little bit and ended where the so- the solo originally starts or just go out on that awesome solo pull down into the into that that final that final little bit of verse. Yeah. I see what you mean. I do want to remind you that this was the 1970s. Mm -hmm. That's true. People had perhaps longer attention spans. It just feels adding the same riffs and the same lyrics, adding the same two stanzas at the end doesn't add to it, though. I know what you mean, and I I respect you, and you're wrong. Because... (laughs) For me, for me, it it feels it it sort of feels like the cyclical experience of seeing the same homeless person every single day, on your commute to work, whatever your rounds are, and and having that recurring feeling like it's almost an intimate it's almost an intimacy because you see that person all the time. Mm. You feel like maybe you could help them. Have you done enough? You know, how many times have you tried to help them? You know, it's it's sort of it's sort of this ongoing relationship and i feel like that's that's what it speaks that that's what the form of the song speaks to for me i get that i totally get that would you like I do. to hear a story from uncle omen's story time do we have time <laughs> you can cut it if you want when i lived in london uh, when i was studying there there was a homeless guy who was always at the same spot on my street between my tube station and my apartment and I would see him and I would say hi to him. Sometimes I would give him change. One time he stopped me and he was like, hey, listen, you know, is there any way you can go into that Tesco? It's a British grocery store and, and get me something. And I was like, you know what? Yes, dude, I've seen you enough times. Like I will I will go into that Tesco. I have to go in there anyway and I will get you something. What do you want? And he was like a pack of cigarettes. And I was like, are you kidding me? I got mad at him. And I said to him, I was like, are you kidding me? Like I'm offering to go and buy you, you know, anything from inside that store. And you don't want food? You want you want cigarettes and a and a beer? He had asked for a beer as well. I was like, you want <laughs> cigarettes and a beer? And he was like, he was like, he was like, look, if I wanted a sandwich from there, I could just walk in and take it and walk out. But they keep the cigarettes behind the counter. So I bought him a pack of cigarettes. <laughs> but how does that? <laughs> Where's the logic? He didn't... How does that make it okay to buy him the cigarettes? Because that's what he needed in his life. He presented me a he presented me a convincing argument as to why I should buy him cigarettes instead of food, and I was I was so taken by his logic of it in the moment that I 
I went and got him his cigarettes. <laughs> I mean, uh, on the side of compassion, yes, I 100% uh, totally get it. Yeah. <laughs> but his argument, his argument is garbage. He wanted a specific brand, too. <sighs> oh, yeah. Did he send you back for <laughs> to return him and get it? <laughs> What's this crap? <laughs> get back in there. <laughs> No, he was a nice guy. Should we wrap this up, Nick? I think so. I'm, I I don't really have much more to say about it. I could literally talk about this song until until the sun comes up. That's that's a long way away. Yeah. But I so won't. let's not. So let's yeah. Let's, let's not. not do that. Uh, just in summation, good song, really good song, great start to a great album. I think there's. There's better, less, for lack of a better term, less popular songs on on Aqualung. Yes. In conclusion, one of the greatest rock songs of history. Holy cow. I can't believe. I, I, I was nervous about this episode, Nick. Really? Yeah. What do you say about Aqualung? Well. I feel like we haven't said know, enough, to be honest. Go back to the beginning and listen. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's what we say. Yeah. <laughs> What are we listening to next week? What can we talk tall to our listeners about next week, Nick? Next week is the song where our our hired help has gotten her name and her sting. It is Cross-Eyed Mary. Can't wait. The Mary part, not the crow. Yeah. yeah. What? Uh, until next week, though, you can... Ooh... If you're feeling alone, you don't have to go down to the army and get a cup of tea. You can come down to the bog, which is iTunes, <laughs> and give us a dog end of a review. Five five star review a la mode. <laughs> Smear your your greasy fingers on your shabby keyboard <laughs> and snot us out a review with good intent. After after you give us a review and five stars, I don't care what happens with the frilly panties. Spit out the pieces of your broken opinion onto the internet. <laughs> Until next time, I'm Omen Said. And I'm Nick McGill. We are Feckless Moms. And this is Talk Tall to Me. Talk to me as the uh, member of the Fleckless Moms Radio Network. <laughs> <laughs>